Welcome to the Relationship Help Show, your time with Dr. Roberta Shaler, the Relationship Help Doctor. Through the magic of the internet, Dr. Shaler provides urgent and ongoing care for relationships in crisis to people throughout the world, and she's here for you now. Whether you are experiencing a momentary blow up or the crazy making of life with a partner, ex, child, or parent who is relentlessly difficult, you'll get your questions answered and enjoy her expert guests. Settle in with Dr. Roberta Shaler now. Leave the drama behind and find peace of mind on today's Relationship Help Show. Here's Dr. Shaler. Hello, I have a big question for you. Are you emotionally safe in your relationship? Think about it for a moment. Do you feel safe or do you always have a little bit of concern? Do you ever feel like you're walking on eggshells? That's a big that's a big item. You know, if you feel like you're walking on eggshells, you're not safe. Because that means that you have a concern that whatever you do or whatever you say is not going to be accepted in the way that you said it or did it. It is going to be perhaps twisted or a poor intent taken from it. And then you're going to be blamed or at fault. Is this sounding familiar? Maybe you fell in love with a person who was so amazing that you couldn't believe your luck. This person just seemed to know who you are at the deepest levels, what you need. They were attentive. In fact, they probably said something like really early in the relationship. I know you're the one for me. I'm going to marry you. Or you are the person I've been looking for for my entire life. And you so wanted to believe it. And you did. And if it worked out well and you're emotionally safe, great. But many times it doesn't. Because that soulmate that you so anticipated, that relationship deteriorates into feeling like cellmates, as my friend Ross Rosenberg says. So we don't want to be in a relationship that feels like we're cellmates. And it happens too often. I so wish it didn't, but it does. Now, you've heard when something seems to be too good to be true, it probably is. Well, that happens in relationships, too. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, oh, I've put this on the back burner. I haven't wanted to look at this. And, oh, do I have to look at it? I really invite you to do that today because your life is going by. And if you are emotionally unsafe in your relationship, that's just too hard. And it's definitely unnecessary. I want to help you with that. So one big thing is true. You are responsible for keeping yourself safe. Not that other person who promised to love and cherish and keep you and protect you. No, you are responsible for keeping yourself safe. And sometimes when you're so charmed and enchanted and that seemingly perfect person comes into your life, you forget that, that you are the one who's responsible for you. And you are the one who's 100% responsible for teaching other people how to treat you. But if back in your early life, you didn't learn these things and you didn't embody these things, then today is the day to start thinking about that. Today is the day to say, you know, I am tired of feeling unsafe, of feeling like I'm walking on eggshells or afraid to be myself. Or I'm second guessing everything that I say or do because that's never going to get anywhere good. So when you're in a relationship in the beginning and you you are just so sure that this is your soulmate, you kind of abandon your concerns and often your good judgment because you are enjoying the experience of falling in love and being swept off your feet. And it is delicious. It's juicy. It's lovely. And I don't blame you for a moment. But once you wake up and find that maybe things have gone a little bit south, don't keep trying to patch up and mend the vision that you had. See what's in front of you. And sometimes, of course, you meet the perfect person and they are 
exactly that, your soulmate, and things get better and better. Uh, and those relationships, of course, you're emotionally safe, and you can build and enrich your emotional intimacy and safety, and it's wonderful. But there are far too many others that just don't work out that way. So here's a big bubble burster. There are people in the world who simply want and need to control you and to have power over you. Big, right? It is a bubble burster because so many of us want to believe that everybody is loving and kind and honest, and they're not. So maybe you're in a relationship with a person who has mm, tarnished a little, let's say, since you began the relationship. And all that charm and seduction and seeming perfection is a little short-lived. In fact, with many people, it usually only lasts as long as it takes to get you, to move in with you, to marry you, or to take control of you by deciding that you're going to start a family so somebody is pregnant and then after that it simply deteriorates into them wanting to control you your life your friends your family and your finances none of that is emotionally safe and with that need for control and power the charm and the seduction and the perfection actually becomes what it always was, which is lying, exploitation, and manipulation. Yep, that's it. Lying, exploitation, and manipulation. I know you don't want to believe it. You want to keep the happily after, after dream alive. I know you do because you're a good person and you want to believe that other people are good. And you want to believe the lies. They're magical. They really are. I understand that. You're enchanted. It sounded perfect. And you want to believe the promises. You can still hear them ringing in your ear. I know you can. You want to believe those promises, even though the evidence of your everyday life with this person is telling you something completely different. And yet you hold on. You honestly believe that if you do something, some magical something, if only I'm more patient, more kind, more nurturing, more understanding, less demanding, then things will get better. And so you believe that change is possible. And you hope for that change. And maybe even you fall into the trap they're setting for you, that hijackal trap that we'll talk about later, that says everything is your fault. And you start to believe that if only you did more, or were more, or had more even, then they would be happy. But it's not your job to make another human happy unless they're your children. Did you, do you know that? Happiness is an inside job for grown-ups. It's not your job to make other people happy. You may want to give them things and love them and take care of them and all. But it's not your job to make them happy. And that's a big issue we'll talk about for another day. But when you're in an emotionally unsafe relationship, your partner is counting on you, believing it's your fault things are not working out. You got that? They're counting on you believing that it's your fault. In fact, once you think about it, you'll realize that actually... They've told you everything is your fault. And they tell you that repeatedly. I can almost feel the pennies dropping as you're listening to this. It may not be you. It may be your best friend or your sister or your, your father or your uncle. You know, I work with people all over the world. And whether they're male or female, young or old or in between, they still fall prey to these people who need power over you. And they continually live in an emotionally unsafe environment. And finally, by the time they come to talk to me, we're on the way away from that. From those behaviors, from those engagements, from stopping believing the lies and seeing the manipulations seeing the seduction to get what the other person wants, 
So very important. And because your partner tells you all the time that it's your fault, they may even demean you further and say, yes, it's your fault. And don't think about leaving because nobody else would put up with you. And so you then start to second guess everything that you do because you don't want to be alone. And then they know they've got you. That's the ultimate gotcha, is that you're afraid nobody else would want you. So you stay with this person and you believe what they're selling. And I hope you will stop doing that. I hope that today or maybe another day earlier than even now, this is the final time that you hear something that says, okay, enough. I am not going to continue down this path. You are not emotionally safe. And it's highly likely you're not safe at all in any way. So let's back up for a minute and talk about, well, what is emotional safety really about? I like this quote from Anais Nin. She said, we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. We don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. So when you're wearing your favorite pair of rose-colored glasses, you miss all the red flags. And in the beginning, of course, we, we're, we're in love. We have our rose-colored glasses. We want that person to appear wonderful. And red flags disappear when you're wearing rose-colored glasses. You don't want to see them anyway. You don't want to burst the bubble or, or uh, blow up the myth that this is all wonderful. And any little thing that you see, you kind of justify or rationalize or make an excuse for. And, and although it makes you uncomfortable, you don't believe your own discomfort because you so want to believe what the other person is saying on their good days and their good moments. And so you, you do all this rationalizing and justifying and making excuses, and yet you're the one who's hurting. A little something about these people, these hijackals that I'll talk about later. They're really good at turning you into feeling guilty because they can even turn on the tears. They can do all kinds of things to manipulate, exploit, and seduce you into believing that you're the wrong way and they are right. It's a pattern. There are cycles. This is the way it happens. So if you're a trusting, loving, honest, and reliable person, you expect everybody else to be. That's what Anais Nin was saying. We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. So we expect people to be like us. And so we're honest and open. And we forget to take off the rose-colored glasses and have a good look at what reality is presenting to us because we don't want the fantasy to go away. We don't want it to end. So we keep making excuses for it. And we then are allowing ourselves to be misused and maybe abused. And when you're emotionally unsafe, you are likely being emotionally and at least verbally abused. So you're emotionally unsafe when you cannot be open and honest and reliable and vulnerable without being fearful of being put down or discounted or made fun of. When only one person is open and honest and vulnerable, too often the other person is power hungry and they're going to use you as a doormat. Don't let anyone wipe their feet on you. It's very important for you to recognize what might be going on here. I know you might be sitting there saying, oh, you make it all sound so doom and gloom and awful and you're painting a bunch of people into a corner and they're terrible. Watch for that because there are people who are behaving the way I'm speaking about, and I know how difficult it is to believe this. And sadly, these people are very fearful. They've had a rough life, and this they're doing the only thing that they know to do to survive. But that doesn't mean that you become a caregiver to their insecurities and their demands for power. That's just not fair. And that's not what you were put on this earth to do either. So 
if all this is making sense to you, then you need to know that to be safe means being free from harm or hurt. And it also means being free from anticipating being harmed or hurt. And when someone wants power over you all the time, your freedom is in jeopardy. You are not free from being harmed or hurt or discounted or demeaned. All the things that people do when they need to have power over you. You're not emotionally safe and you may well not be physically safe either. So you have to be safe to risk and to expose and to share. And there's even a whole book about emotional safety written by Don Catherall. And I want to read you a quote. He said, one partner can say something stupid and the other person ignores it or doesn't look at it as significant. There's a level of trust. But when they lose that safety, everything has the potential to flare up. They stop taking things at face value or giving each other the benefit of the doubt. And that's when you're emotionally unsafe. You're afraid. You don't want to be. You just want to trust so that you can make excuses for the behaviors. But you know deep down that you are not feeling safe. So you're not emotionally safe. Can you acknowledge that to yourself? Right now, this minute, are you feeling safe in your relationship? Maybe there's just a little area of unsafety. Or maybe everything about your relationship is feeling unsafe. So here's some questions for you to just reflect on for a moment. Can you trust your partner with your innermost feelings and not fear being put down? Can you trust your partner to listen to you with interest, attention, and compassion? Can you trust your partner to want the best for you and do what is possible to make it happen? Can you trust your partner to keep your secrets safe and protect your vulnerabilities? If not, you are emotionally unsafe. Got that? Quick test. Can you trust your partner with your innermost feelings and not fear being put down? Can you trust your partner to listen to you with interest and compassion? Can you trust your partner to want the best for you and do what is possible to make that happen? Can you trust your partner to keep your secrets safe and protect your vulnerabilities? If these things are true, if any of those things are true, great. If you can trust your partner. But if you can't, and you're hearing this moment, wow, really, I can't do that. And I've never really wanted to admit that to myself, but I'm willing to admit it right this moment. I can't trust my partner to do those things. Then this is the moment to recognize that you very well may be emotionally unsafe. And it may be the case that you have been in that state for quite a long time. So what are you putting up with? We're going to talk more of that about that after after the break and after my, we talk with my guest today. And if you're listening to this piece of the of the show, I want you to recognize that you can go to the you can go to bbsradio.com slash relationship help show and you can hear much more about these topics. So just think for a moment. Are you emotionally safe? Hello, this is Dr. Roberta Shaler. Are these stories and questions on today's show sounding familiar to you? Are you ready to say no more to the abuse from toxic people in your life? I'm so glad. You matter and you deserve to have real love, true love in your life. Love from yourself and love from others. Not that demeaning, discounting and dismissive masquerade that a hijackal pretends is love. I can help you regain yourself, your self-esteem, your self-confidence after a life with a hijackal, whether it was your partner, an ex, a parent or a child. Let's work together now. For individual sessions or small group coaching, visit forrelationshiphelp.com slash join. Talk soon.
Hi, we've come to the guest portion of the Relationship Health Show, Handling Hijackal Havoc. And today I'm so excited because a while ago, I was at a conference and I met this wonderful woman we're going to talk to today. And we remembered that we'd met each other a long time ago, but we never really talked about the things that are important to us. So I invited Antia Boyd to be on the program today and to share some things with you. And uh, she has some very interesting things she's up to. How do you like the sound of magnetize your man or finding the one? Wow, huh? <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about Antia. You can see her there, but let me tell you a little bit about her because she struggled for years and she was in fear. She was wasting time and attracting, guess what? Emotionally unavailable men. And she finally broke through, hired a dating coach, and all improved. So she now has a fabulous, supportive, wonderful, and I can tell you, handsome husband. <laughs> and and uh, what she ha what she has done now is help thousands of people, single women in particular, all over the world, to start finding the right man for them to share their life with. And in order to do that, you have to find a way to be in a relationship that has trust and good communication, and you can't let old issues get in your way. So she's been helping people expunge the record of old issues for the last 11 plus years. She studied personality psychology at UC Berkeley, and she's spoken at Google and on hundreds of stages, and I saw a photo of her on Facebook at Harvard the other day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, we're going to talk today about how to have a happy happy long-term relationship with the right man effectively and for the men listening of course you can reverse this and think about this about finding the right woman without being afraid of today's watchword the fear of vulnerability sadness or anxiety and Antia lives here where I do in beautiful San Diego County with her handsome husband Brody so welcome to the program Antia Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Roberta. Well, I'm excited to talk to you because I have some, some questions that really need answering. Um, what was the main thing, the one main thing that turned you from looking in the wrong places for Mr. Wright to looking in the right place to find him? Well, you know, first of all, because I grew up in an emotionally absent household in Eastern Germany, for me, it was, in, and I had a conflict inside of myself, right? Because I developed a coping mechanism out of that because my mom always said, you know, don't bother me and uh, asking for love is too much. It's really, you know, healing that conflict because a part mm -hmm. of me wanted the love and another part was saying, okay, I don't need the love, right? I'm, and so I became emotionally unavailable, but I didn't know that, right? And so for me, the biggest healing piece was, after attracting a lot of emotionally unavailable men, that it was my own lack of vulnerability that made them the right men stay away. Well, yeah, because if we are not safe to be emotionally vulnerable, and that becomes a pattern that's been established before we even had language, we don't really know that that happened. You know, many times I'm working with clients, Antia, as probably you are, and we uncover the fact that they've never gone back and examined all the little goodies and not so goodies that were put in their locker uh, when they were young and how it then became part of the fabric of their being and it's keeping them from having the life they most want so how did you make that switch what did you have to do because i was speaking earlier uh, about emotional safety and in order to feel emotionally safe we have to be in an environment that allows for vulnerability so what is it that happened for you yeah, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's it's really interesting, but uh, first of all, I created the emotional safety for myself. Um, and what that meant was actually allowing myself to whatever emotion came up for me to love that, to celebrate that. So if anger was coming up for me, to congratulate myself for that and to express it, not target it, not yell at people, right? But to move it for my body, you know, mm -hmm. the same with sadness like to really um, congratulate and appreciate and acknowledge myself for all. So in other words, like really 
reframing my relationship I had with all the sort of like, you know, not really wanted emotions that we all have inside of ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And then turned my relationship around and turned it into a celebration. Yeah, you know, that sound, isn't it wonderful that you could sum all of that work up in about four sentences? So if you listen to this program, know that this was a journey. This wasn't a realization one day. Oh, woke no. up and went, oh, now I'm not going to be vulnerable because now I can allow myself to have the emotions and I know what to do with them. It's a journey. Absolutely. And- <laughs> absolutely. Of resistance. There's going to be a lot of resistance and a lot of story getting in the way, right? In the old programming, you know, sure. that I certainly had. And if we're talking about vulnerability today, the old programming from vulnerability is its weakness. You're being yeah. taken advantage of. You're a doormat mm-hmm. if you're vulnerable, right? So I had to overcome all those different programmings inside of myself and stories. Mm-hmm. They're nothing more than stories, right? And internal representations that the society has of vulnerability and what vulnerability looks like. Yeah, and you know, I want to pick up on what you said about people immediately thinking vulnerability equals weakness because that is a prevalent cultural definition and we have been accultured to believing that that to be vulnerable is weak when actually the reverse is true to be able to be vulnerable and to scope out a safe environment in which to be vulnerable is the the step that is often missing because that's where we get the depth of relationship. That's when we can really experience, you know, as Susan Campbell said, intimacy is four little words into me. See when we can have that, that actual allowing the other person in, we then can enrich our experience of life through the enriched experience that we have with our partners. But it does take, work and steps and it begins by recognizing it so can you give us an idea of how you help women with this area of life yeah absolutely so you know what happens is you know so many times women have a certain title around vulnerability and for some it's actually the opposite it's like maybe being arrogant they're like i don't want to be considered arrogant so i'm not going to be myself because vulnerability doesn't always have to look like you know, sadness or anger, right? Oh, it can also look all the other unwanted emotions or representations of yourself and aspects of yourself that you have a judgment towards. So the biggest piece is really, I have them develop a really sensual and pleasurable relationship with all of those parts. So if, if they say, you know, I don't want to be a bitch. Well, first you have to own that word, right? To transform it. Okay. And say, Yes, you are. You can be. We all can be. Okay. Now we we have the free will choice not to, but we have the choice and that freedom to be that. And um, and the minute they really own that, it really sets them free because now they can actually choose versus coming from a place of resistance where you cannot choose, right? Where you are actually you're gonna end up, you know, really. Um, representing all of the parts that you don't want to represent because you're focusing on them. How can I not represent them? Right. So I really celebrate. I mean, when women come to me and say, you know, I'm selfish and uh, cause I know you help um, people with hijackles, you know, women with hijackles and um, it's for the women to allow themselves to be selfish. And that to me, I find most of my clients is that's the biggest piece of vulnerability is mm-hmm. to be selfish because, you know, they were dealing with hijackles uh, either like in their childhood or in their relationships. And, you know, so they're like, I don't want to be like that. I'm never going to be like that. So, so first off, they have to become everything that they don't want to become. You know, that's <laughs> the first step, you know, <laughs> to put it in simple words. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't know if I'd go that far in my practice, but I want to say something about the selfishness piece because I was working with a family yesterday and, and they have a new member in the family, the son married. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we were you know, having a little mediation about how things were working and not working. And the young woman said, oh, well, I don't, I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to ask for too much. 
And I said, oh, we need to have a conversation about selfish. You know, selfish is to want something wonderful for yourself. It's overboard when you don't want other people to have it and you think you should have it. That's where we get the bad rap for selfishness. Mm -hmm. But what I said to her was, you have the absolute right to ask for what you need and want. And an emotional growing up can hear equally yes or no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you have the right to ask. You have the right to want that. So how does that fit in what you were talking about? Oh, so much so because one thing that my women do is they become really apologetic about it. So they say <laughs> something, you know, in my, in my clarity calls and uh, then they laugh. And, uh, but it wasn't funny in that moment, right? So it's totally out of context. And, uh, and when I inquire that, it always turns out, well, my desires were never met. And, you know, I, you know, I don't know if that was appropriate to, to state that desire. And so there's this fear of inadequacy and, uh, you know, having inappropriate or out of context desires. And I mean, needless to say, what they're saying is really so minimal. I mean, that is really asking for breadcrumbs and they feel like they're asking for the castle. You know, I mean, it's really out of relation, right? Out of proportion. Um, and it's because they have been in abusive relationships or childhoods and uh, were put down. Me too. I mean, as soon as I was rising my confidence, my dad would always say, who do you think you are? Exactly. Put that one back in the model. <laughs> right? Exactly. Right? So so what do you think a little girl does when she hears that from her parent uh, day in, day out, as soon as she gains some confidence, right? She's like, well, I'm not going to ask for too much, right? I'm not, eventually, I'm not going to ask for anything. Yeah. Right? Because, you know, who do I think I am? I'm, I'm nothing, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's basically... Uh, what the internal representation is of desires for them. It's like, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, in, well, indulge. That's like another word, right? I don't want to indulge in my desires, right? And what I really want. Well, I no, can't. no. Get out of that space right away. You know, right? think about the other person. Yeah. You know, you know it's, it's one of those things, Antia, I have a few pet peeves about ways we use our language. And one of the things that I really invite everybody to question is this maxim that we have adopted in our culture that says, give until it hurts. Yeah. Imagine if mm -hmm. everybody did that. Like, what are you thinking? Uh, let's have some balance. And what I hear in what you're talking about is that we forget that we are equally a able to have what we want as we are willing to be in a reciprocal situation. Yeah. And I always tell my clients there are three hallmarks of a successful relationship where people are not feeling like there is uh, a problem and that is equality, reciprocity and mutuality. And if your relationship meets those three things then you are going to feel good then you are going to feel like a full participant not somebody as you say asking for crumbs and i want to go back to what you said about saying i'm sorry for everything i come from canada we do that a lot and i was working with a client uh, the other day and I've been in the United States for almost 20 years, so I really see the difference. I was working with a client last night, and uh, I went over time quite on purpose. I have a clock right there, I know. And what, And I, I happened to say something like, well, I can't remember that third thing that you said because I'm getting a little tired. And she went, oh, I'm sorry, I'm keeping you too long. And I said, no, do not say you're sorry. I am choosing to be on the phone with you. Mm. And, you know, we get into those habits to be sorry for everything. And women do it more frequently than men, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. It's really interesting. I don't really see too many men be apologetic. Um, and I think part of it is like there's, there's old roles where women are supposed to. I was just talking with a client yesterday, you know, where... She's like, you know, there's all those old roles, you know, of like how we're supposed to behave, yeah. be well-spoken and well-mannered and just kind of like just be perfect in society, right? You're receiving the guests. You're just, you just say the right amount of words, but not too much. You don't want to stand out. You know, make sure everybody else is standing out, right? 
Um, and, you know, in Australia, they have even like the, the tall puppy syndrome, right? Where that's even perpetuated more. Don't stand out. Don't congratulate yourself. Don't pat yourself on the back. And um, so that's even cultures in the world where this is really, you know, China too, you know, I mean, you're uh, my Asian clients are really like, if you just talk about cultural differences, um, sure. very, very different. Yeah. Canadians apologize for everything. <laughs> Canadians will apologize for apologizing. You know, it's and of course, that's a big broad stroke, but it's in the culture. It's just the way it is. And There's so if you come from a home where you had to be apologetic for breathing and taking up space, and then you're in a culture that has a similar ethic, and Correct. then you wonder why you're not having great relationships that make you feel equal and celebrated and joyous. Yes. it's not a really big question is it Antia? Yeah, yeah absolutely you know and so so that's why I take the really extreme approach because I feel like you know my the women I attract are so far on the giving side I mean they're depleted right and so I have them swing all the way to the other side so they end up in the middle right so that's why I'm more radical and have them approach every emotion because then, then there's nothing left and we end up in balance, what you talked about before, right? I love that mm -hmm. in their equilibrium, who they really are. And then they know how that feels. Mm -hmm. And so when they date or in a relationship, they know, oh, I'm out of equilibrium. This doesn't feel aligned here right now. What just shifted? You know, maybe I need to say no. And, and with vulnerability, by the way, also comes saying no. Now, how about that? <laughs> saying no without guilt. Imagine, imagine having, having that strength to just say no. I often say to my clients, did you know that no is a complete sentence? You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Well, no, but no. And you know, no, right. because, just no, no because, right? <laughs> yeah. just it's no. So um, I, I want to ask a question about the vulnerability piece, but also like when you're, you're helping someone with these things and they, they've been over here, mm -hmm. do you find that they have to go way over here before they come to the middle? I think so. Here's why, Dr. Dr. Roberta. It's because if I just say, well, you can swing a little bit, but watch out, you don't swing all the way, then they're doing the same thing again. So they will never find the middle. They will still go more towards pleasing the other person because subconsciously they're still being told, don't be too loud, don't be too proud, don't be too bright, right? So I have them go all the way, be bright, be loud. And I have women always tell me, are you sure you can hold my anger? I'm like, trust me, that's nothing I haven't seen before, right? And, uh, and really push them through because they're never going to go to that level of anger again. Because when they are allowed to break through um, this sound barrier, if you think about the sound barrier, right, where um, it's, it's uh, the speed is faster than, than uh, what is it, sound. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically the same thing. So I'm imagining that the emotional capacity is like, you know, breaks through the sound barriers, breaks through the emotional barrier that they have, and they will never break through it again. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. You know, and I was working with a client a couple of days ago, and... Mm -hmm. She came on the call and I said, well, what did you do about the hijackle in your life? And she said, I don't want to tell you. And I said, no, I want to know what did you do? And she saw him again, which is why she didn't want to tell me because we'd agreed she was going to go no contact. But she said she saw him. She stayed overnight with him. No sex involved, just comfort and companionship. She woke up in the morning and he said, I want you to move back in. I really, really love you. And God bless her and our work together because she said to him, I need to be able to trust you. And he said, oh, I, you can trust me. She said, good. Hand me your phone and your computer. And he, he said, sure, 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 no problem. And then a few minutes later, she saw him get up and go rushing to the bathroom and she went she knew where his phone had been she went and he got into the bathroom and locked the door and he had his phone so because they had lived together before she knew where the key was she walked into the bathroom and there he was you know what she found was he was on several dating sites she read everything that he had done and said to other people she got furious and she was absolutely so angry which she never allowed herself to be that angry mm. that she threw his phone in the pond and she said to me oh what a terrible thing to do i said i don't think so 
<laughs> you know, I don't think so. I think, I think it's great, you know, because it's like a shock to his system. It's like a pattern interrupt, right? So like something is going to happen to him where it had like a bigger impact, especially for a narcissist, right? Like it's, it's perfect because that his phone is everything. His laptop is everything, right? That's where all of the celebrations are in. So yeah, absolutely. And the other piece I also want to mention in relationship is um, to preface already vulnerability. So we did a shadow ceremony the night before our wedding where we acknowledged already our deepest, darkest fears, our deepest, darkest wounds that we had. My husband's was, he doesn't want, he didn't want to be trapped. You know, he had been trapped by his mom. She's overprotective. And I had the fear of not being good enough. Right. So, and, and that really prefaced our entire marriage, our entire relationship, because again, this is like our standard. Yeah. This is where we always go, right? We sense right away when we're not, you know, when we're not as vulnerable because we know how that felt like. That's anchored. Mm -hmm. So that's another way um, that I recommend right. really having that honest relationship. But imagine being able to be vulnerable to that degree. I mean, you two have really embodied the things that you teach. Many, many people going back to vulnerability, if they said that to their partner, it would perhaps scare the pants off the partner and they would be petrified to say it and we get into a relationship of avoidance. But listen to what you two did. We're just going to take off the covers and unwrap everything and say, here's the deepest, darkest, worst thing that I could ever feel in the world. And I'm going to tell you what it is. And you did that because you knew you were emotionally safe to do it. Right. Tomorrow right. at the wedding, he was not going to stand up and say, well, even though she's absolutely afraid of this, I'm going to do my best. He was not going to expose you. He was not going to take it lightly. He was not going to make fun of you. And many people have had the experience of endeavoring to be vulnerable and being treated so badly. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, that's definitely a big piece. And that's what I mean, like to find, of course, the right partner for yourself. And that's why it starts with the self vulnerability, because that's when you attract the yeah. right partner, right? Because that's what I really want to say was when, I was vulnerable. I attracted my husband who was vulnerable. Like I was really congruent with all of my emotions. I wasn't hiding anything. Right. And he told me within a few hours that I'm the girl of a story. So we met and a few hours later, he told me I'm it. Right. And I really believe it was because I looked at all my parts. I looked where I'm selfish or where I'm afraid to be angry or where I don't trust my own power. You know, that's another conversation, like trusting your own power. Yeah, we could have that conversation another time. Uh, right. I, and, you know, Auntie, I, I want to ask a question before our time together today ends. And my question is, why would I want to magnetize the man? Well, versus chasing him. And that, that, that's what we were thinking, right? Because, uh, because you're, you're in your incongruence. You're like the queen, right? And you're, it's effortless. You're not depleting yourself. You're not giving your power away. You're not selling out on your values, right? But you have him come to you. And like you said, I love that what you said, you know, no is a complete sentence. That's such an embodiment of the queen, right? And so what's so great about that is, is you attract a man who not only likes you, but he also respects you. And don't we all want that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, we do. So much to talk about, Antia. So I want to tell everyone, you can go to magnetizetheman.com mm -hmm. and get more of Antia and her wisdom and her help. And make sure that you do that because you don't want to have any any places left, any stones left unturned in your emotional life if you want to have the very best life you possibly can. So thank you, Antia, for being with us. And uh, I hope everyone will go and visit magnetizetheman.com. And I hope we'll talk again another day. Hi, this is Dr. Roberta Shaler. Handling hijackles is exhausting. It's never ending. An endless cycle of crazy making, alienation, and constant drama. 
And cycles are difficult to step out of, I know, because I've been there too. And that's why I reach out to you to offer the insight, skills, and strategies you need to heal. My small group programs, Handling Hijackles and Hijackal Recovery and Rediscovery, will shortcut your journey to healing, to save your sanity, and to stopping the crazy making. Visit forrelationshiphelp.com slash join now and let's talk soon. So part two of answering the question, are you emotionally safe in your relationship? And I asked you these questions in part one. Can you trust your partner with your innermost feelings and not fear being put down? Can you trust your partner to listen to you with interest, attention, and compassion? Can you trust your partner to want the best for you and do what is possible to make it happen? And can you trust your partner to keep your secrets safe and protect your vulnerabilities? I hope that you can because you need to look at a few things. What are you putting up with and what are you making excuses for? What are you putting up with and what are you making excuses for? What are you continually rationalizing and justifying that is just plain, uncaring, thoughtless, and dismissive behavior on your partner's part? Remember, we've ripped off those rose-colored glasses now, so we have to see it. And it may just be uncaring, thoughtless, selfish, power-hungry, dismissive behavior. And you may have been trained to think it's your fault that your partner's behaving that way, and it's not. You're just simply in an emotionally unsafe relationship. So these destructive patterns are in your partner. They are not your fault. Even though your partner keeps telling you they are, and that's how they keep power over you. And if you go along with it, you are continuing to enable your partner to misuse and abuse you. Sorry, I know that sounds harsh. And you don't want to think about it as abuse. And you don't want to believe your partner is abusive. And you don't want to think of yourself as allowing yourself to be in an abusive relationship. But that doesn't change anything. It is abuse. So stop taking the blame for your partner's poor behavior. It's not your fault. It's a choice the other person is making. Stop making excuses for your partner's abuse of you and the relationship. Again, rip off those rose-colored glasses and throw them away for good. I mean it. Throw them away for good. You've got to be cashing your reality check here and now. Those rose-colored glasses only blind you to situations in which you can find yourself trapped. So gone. Rip them off and throw them away. Because you wouldn't be wanting to be so foolish as to realize that you've been wearing them and you've been trapped again. If you have a little self-esteem and self-confidence, you may be trapped because you continually want to believe when others put you down. Don't. I want you to step up. I want you to step into your self-esteem and your self-confidence. I want you to do that because it is the best thing for you. You know, you're not here to do what I want. I realize that. But for you to have the best life possible, it is important for you to step fully into your own awareness and consciousness and power and have the self-esteem and self-confidence to move away from emotionally unsafe relationships. You are the only person who can keep yourself emotionally safe. You. You know, you can, you can talk to other people about what's going on, but it all comes down to you taking steps to keep yourself emotionally safe. I know. You were hoping that person would protect you. You were hoping that that person would truly love you and your way of loving. But remember what I said in part one about the Anais Nin quote, that we want to believe that other people are like us. And they're often not. So you are the only person who can keep yourself emotionally safe. Being with someone who really needs power over you to survive, that power looks like keeping you uncertain and in fear, 
is the first thing you need to recognize. Now, I wrote a little ebook for you. It's free. It's called How to Spot a Hijackal. And that will help you see the patterns, the traits, and the cycles that you may be stuck in. And I created that term hijackal because I wanted a term that was non-clinical to describe a person who hijacks a relationship for his or her own purposes. And then what they do, those hijackals, is they relentlessly scavenge the relationship for more and more power and status and control. Sound familiar? So, does it feel familiar? Because that may be your first indication. You may be immune to hearing it, but does it feel familiar? So, read the ebook. You'll see the traits and the patterns and the cycles. Because power is the air that hijackals breathe. They need it, they crave it, and they demand it. And when you're with a hijackal, you're supposed to be suffocated so the hijackal can take control. And you may be handing them the power and control by allowing yourself to be suffocated. That's why only you can move yourself into a place where you're emotionally safe. So stop. If your relationship that is emotionally safe and you, you're with a hijackal and you recognize it, don't be thinking the hijackal will change. Hijackals almost never change. In fact, I haven't seen one that did, but I'm leaving a little wiggle room for that magic one person who might. So it's hard to believe because you've been telling yourself that with enough love or compassion or patience or whatever, they will change. They won't. And I know it sounds harsh, but I have to tell you this. A hijackal could care less about you as long as he or she is getting what they need for themselves. Hijackals don't have love to give you. They have uses for you. Another bubble burster. Hijackals don't have love to give you. They have uses for you. Awful. Horrible. Wake up. See it. Wake up and smell the herbal tea, you know? You have the right to be emotionally safe. You have the right and you have the responsibility to keep yourself emotionally safe. So are you willing to rip off those rose-colored glasses now and see how it is? Great, great. That's a big vote in favor of yourself and you deserve that. So believe it. Emotional safety means feeling accepted. It's a sense that you are safe from emotional harm or hurt or attack. And a hijack will never allow you to feel accepted, acceptable, or good enough. If all this sounds horribly familiar, I'm sorry. But it is the first important step to recovery when you recognize that. And the next is to get some help, gather some new attitudes, some mindsets, and some strategies to step into your power and to say, no to abuse. You have the right to be emotionally safe. And I hope that you will exercise that right. That's the best exercise you can possibly get. So if you want more information about all these things, I've written about them, go to forrelationshiphelp.com. Get the free ebook at hijackals.com. And go to my YouTube channel, For Relationship Help. There's so much there to help you. And if you want a little something else, there are two free checklists at For Relationship Help, and you'll see them in the navigation bar. So until we talk again, exercise your right to be emotionally safe. Talk soon. There you have it. If you want more, you can work with Dr. Shayla directly. She's eager to help you resolve your relationship issues. Have a question? Call in early to next week's show to talk with Dr. Shaler on air. Get her expert insights and advice by subscribing to her blog, newsletter, and YouTube channel. We're here for you. Don't be a stranger. Join us again next week. And in the meantime, visit forrelationshiphelp.com.